Is, is it okay if I take the mask off while I speak? I think so. Yeah. No, I mean, okay. Okay. So we'll call this meeting to order of the uh, Southern River Homeowners Association uh, for Saturday, October 17th. Uh, this entire meeting is being uh, taped. And so I'll begin by calling a roll, uh, Director Beenan, Here. Director Burke, Director Gillies, uh, Director Goki, I think is still dealing with back problems, uh, Director Mobley. Director Murray, here. Director Peterson, here, Director Smith, and I am here, Brad Skinner. Uh, the first, uh, we, we, this is our normal, uh, more formal meeting. We had a work session yesterday, and the work session just allowed us to hear from uh, various perspectives and develop a conclusions that would allow us to make more formal actions here today. So, but in each case, both the work session as well as the um, formal meeting, we have an owner's forum. So anyone who would like to address, I see Ray and uh, Marilyn Johnson here. Uh, did you want to cover that issue that was being, you handed out earlier? Thank you for letting me make a statement this morning. As you see in the little handout I gave you, we're sorry we didn't make the work session yesterday, but we had doctor appointments in Bend. Uh, we're still seeing bikers on circle in two and three. In fact, most of them are coming out of Shark and going on to circle two. Oh, sorry about that. You're good, you're, you're good. We can hear you. Yeah. You want me to do that again? No. Okay. I think we're good. Okay. I'm a teacher at heart, so I'm used to projecting my voice anyway. So bikers are still on circle two and three, most of them coming out of shark and going into circle two, which is a very blind curve if you're a driver. Um, and we're still seeing bikers without lights or reflectors at dark, dark and at dusk. I know it's an SROA rule, but it's not being enforced. So I don't think we need extra things, but we're really happy to find out that there's a task force that's been put in place to work with the rental companies uh, to enforce the rule. My husband and I are willing to make a financial contribution towards making sure that the rental agencies and everybody have lights and reflectors so that they can be used at dusk and dark. Thank you. Marilyn, thank you so much for your comments. Um, James, what is the, um, it, it, Oregon State law also covers this issue, does it not? Yeah, with regard to uh, lights and reflectors, um, they spread on bike all the time, all over. Uh, you're required to have, uh, after sundown, a uh, light in front of your bike and on the rear you need a blinking red light. So that's something, uh, not even just uh, uh, some river rules, but that's that those rules actually apply for bikes that are on the road, on the public road. So with regard to our pathways, that's something I think as we, as we again, as it gets darker earlier and as we get into the fall and we don't have bike patrol, that's something that's very difficult for the police to monitor. Uh, it, it was the pathways to get into the police patrol out there. So again, I will I work with the police chief. I meet with him oh, at least every two weeks and I'll make him aware of it. Yeah, if you could focus on that uh, with the chief and his staff. Yeah. Um, also, as uh, Marilyn Johnson said, this will be one of the issues in the uh, uh, rental registry process. Uh, we've got a number of issues and uh, we will be focusing on all of these so that people can be informed of our rules and they can be enforced accordingly as the, uh, not only now, but in the future. 
but thank you very much. Uh, I think we're about to make a quick call or a uh, email to the micro shops to make sure yeah. people they, after dark they need light. James, can you uh, pursue that with the yes. bike rental agencies? Yep. And uh, as Mr. and Mrs. Johnson pointed out, this, this is uh, going to involve the rental agencies. Uh, Gene Bennington is part of that, as well as uh, some of the people at Cascara. Cascara. Yeah. So it will be an ongoing process, not only now, but in the future. Um, uh, Bob, did you have uh, a desire to talk to the board? Or? Yeah, a few comments. Please come up. Okay. My name's Bob Stilson. I live at 10 Belknap. And I have a few comments and then just a question for James and the board. Uh, we moved here three years ago and uh, my initial, our initial, uh, initial reaction was, wow, it does not get better than this. Uh, it was kind of a, you, you move into a place and you've got uh, all this work going on in the roundabout, you have the promise, and now the near completion of the North Pool, all this really great stuff happening, and it still is great, and it still is happening, but I think uh, I've been here long enough that I maybe am experiencing what some of you have, who have been longer, may be experiencing, it's like, wow, something has happened overnight here. And we know that COVID happened overnight, seemingly. Uh, we know that uh, suddenly there's a real estate push, uh, maybe caused by the wildfires, people wanting to get out of wherever they are. So there's this flurry of activity. We've got activity over at the lodge with their whole facility that's being built. And so in, in all of this, we have kind of this overall degradation of our facilities that's happening and we can't really put our finger on it and see it all the time until it comes back to bite you. And I, and I see what we're in this situation where things are sort of degrading at a time where resources are tightening up because of we don't have the revenue that we've had in previous years. Uh, I listened to uh, the uh, present, I've, I was here a month ago when the folks gave a presentation about the degradation by the Cardinal Landing Bridge, as well as their own neighborhood with the huge numbers of people that are using the river. I, I, I see the dust being kicked up on the forest road that goes to the takeout point and I've been in the van being transported at some I don't know it was pretty fast because they were trying to keep up with the river usage but that's a big cloud of dust heading in the neighborhood and I understand the concerns about Mary McCallum Park and uh, that all the usage that people want to get out of the boats there and use the area so I you know I see this that Sun River is at this point it feels like we're at a point that cities experience and then that is how to manage growth and uh, the, the main question I had uh, and, and I don't I'm not going to take it I, 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 I'm not going to take a stand and I want this or I want this or we should be doing this because this is a big hole that has to work together. And I'm just wondering, and my question to James would be, it seems like I really uh, understand the neighborhood by the Cardinal Landy Bridge, they're being nuts, driven nuts by the traffic down there. I, I really understand all the, uh, the issues uh, somewhat. And the question I have is, before, do we have a, or should we be working on a comprehensive river plan for Sun River that goes from the up, up river there where you get the bridge up there down to the takeout? 
because what I've, what I've seen along the way, it's if, if you don't address the whole, then we can take care of some of the parts. But if we take care, like if we take care of fencing along the bridge, are we going to be playing whack-a-mole? Because then they're going to take out down the, down the, the river a piece. And I see that along the river, you can see the new trails from the bike path to the river as people figure out how to game the system. Um, so do we, are, you know, is that something we should be really putting ahead of maybe some of these other, or yes. in conjunction with these other concerns? Uh, my two cents is I think that's a, that's a very good idea. And in our office among our staff, we, we talked about that informally. And again, I mean, I would think that if we did a comprehensive river plan, it would include key players, it would include Eastman's County, it would include Forest Service, it would include State Parks and Rec. SROA, among other stakeholders. Um, you know, there are certain things, though, that we can't do. Um, you know, the use of the river itself, you know, we can't do. Um, but things such as access, river access, you know, what I've talked about in our, in our office with our staff is with regard to the Cardinal Landing, is uh, we have a plan as to how we can fix that. You know, we first need to change the rules. We need to adopt rules. Right now, there's nothing in our SROA rules that prevent anyone from getting out of the river onto SROA common property um, and then making their way through the streets, which are open to the public, and having someone pick them up and get a ride home. There's nothing that prevents that. So when working with the police, um, they don't have the ability to enforce that today. So that's what we're working on with our, you know, part of our uh, rental registry task force. It's the, and we have a rules meeting next, next week with our governance committee representatives. So we need rules that we need to adopt. But then there are other things such as restoration along the river, fencing. So a comprehensive plan makes sense, but with regard to the river use and the access, that was the big overwhelming issue that we heard about all summer. Um, I tend to think of it as if you're gonna put rules in place and you're gonna put facilities such as fencing in place that prevent access to the river, you're not doing anything to address the need that there are thousands of people here that exactly. still want access to the river. Um, where do they get in and out of the river? And that's why I say, you know, working with these other partners is best in camp where folks can get in and out of the river. I just listened to the county commissioners last Wednesday. They're, they're going to be coming to us, contacting us again about issues at Harbor Bridge. Um, but, you know, I always look at if you're, if you're going to prevent or want to stop something that people actively want, you need to find a place where you're directing them to. That's how you solve the problem. So, so yes. that, I mean, this is a big long discussion really? we have, and I won't get into it, yeah. but I think a comprehensive river plan that is made up of all those partners that looks at access, you know, use, uh, restoration, um, and what is the, what are the individual um, actions that each one of those entities have to take. This isn't all on Sun River, it's not all right. on SROA. Okay. There are other players that Definitely. But, I, but that's a, I mean, we talk about it in pieces, but I like your idea of saying let's do it. Yeah, yeah. it's a big overarching thing that. Yeah. Right. It's your 100% yes. right. Bob, thank you. Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, I think as James spelled out, we're going to be doing everything we can to enforce our rules. I know James is already working with the county in terms of putting a signage at Harbor Bridge to make it very clear that you're not going to be allowed to get out of the river. Uh, except if you pay the resort $50 uh, or who knows what we'll do at our boat landing. But uh, at Cardinal Bridge is a no-no and we're just going to, and Mary McCallum Park is a no-no and we're going to deal with all of those issues as part of our process that's going on now. And I know um, we are very serious about this. We've heard from both primary residents who live here full-time as well as secondary residents. And so Bob, we're focused on it, but this broader issue of the, the actual plan for the river, we'll give some thought to that. I, I don't know the answer right now. Um, anyone else like to address? All right, well, seeing none, I really uh, appreciate all of you being here. Uh, the next item of, of business is to talk about, um, oh, okay, okay, Mike Goki is now attending, great. Hope your back's better, Mike.
Um, uh, what, the next item is to talk about uh, owners forum from the previous month. Mike normally covers this. Um, we had the same kind of emphasis on, on rules, uh, focus. Uh, Herm Meister was here talking about uh, just the, the visitors here at Sun River and they need to be educated. Uh, we need to have a comprehensive plan with the rental agencies as well as the resort, which we'll be doing. Ray and Marilyn Johnson, who are also here today, uh, suggested, um, again, greater enforcement of the rules and emphasize Cardinal Landing, which again, we're going to be very focused on. Um, Randy Schneider talked about the dust problem primarily uh, on the, uh, the, uh, the point where the resort pulls uh, uh, folks out. Unfortunately, as you know, because COVID, they have to use more buses and more vans to keep the density within the van low or the bus, and that causes more dust. Um, we, we have been informed and we will continue to be informed that um, anyone, anyone driving those buses or vans exceeding 25 miles an hour, the resort has warned everyone they'll be fired. Now, that doesn't necessarily stop everything, but at least it's a step in the right direction, and we're looking at the dust and how we work with the resort over as things dry out again. Um, uh, Jim, uh, Jim uh, Tyvan gave an excellent uh, presentation about all of the issues associated with Cardinal Landing. I think we're all very much aware of that. And uh, we would like to, uh, I know James is working with Jim. We expect progress to be made with the Covenants Committee with the rules tightening and all the things that we can do so that we can enforce access um, and, and block folks that should not be getting out at that point through our common areas and enforcement. So all of those will continue and I, I trust that Jim and James will continue to communicate with us about uh, if we're making the right amount of progress. Those were the primary focus. Again, they have to do with uh, lots of folks coming to Sun River, as Bob said earlier. That, that's not gonna stop, I don't think. Uh, Sun River is becoming a very valuable piece of property for anyone who lives here, as well as anyone who wants to move here. Uh, and with uh, fiber optics and uh, Zoom and everything else, probably people, a lot more people will be moving here. Um, so that that's uh, what I recall from the, uh, the previous month. Uh, just recapping the work session from, uh, from yesterday, Again, we had some good owners forum uh, information in terms of Cindy McCabe stressing uh, various improvements at Mary McCallum Park, which I think we're all focused on and understand the value of that asset. Uh, Lee Haron also focusing on Mary McCallum and rules. Cindy did too, reinforcement. Uh, and then uh, Jane Bubell was here talking about uh, volunteer recognition. We'll be doing that via letter, not at an event this year. Uh, and also talking about uh, ho hopeful improvements or clarification in the design manual as that process gets going. Uh, with the help of James and Scott and uh, uh, Jim Fister from our previous board, and just focusing on where should we uh, uh, change or improve the language so that people have a better understanding of the kind of values that we continue to observe here in Sun River the kind of neighborhoods we want, the kind of redevelopment we want, et cetera. And that'll be proceeding here in, I think, December or so. Um, so the, and also at the meeting itself, we just covered the issues that we'll be covering today. Um, certainly, uh, we received an acknowledgement from Tree City USA. This is the 40th anniversary that this community has been recognized. And uh, and so that's that's quite an accomplishment, even as Jared was saying earlier, even with the windstorm and other things that blew a lot of trees down. Um, we had a very good uh, in-depth uh, discussion about our reserve studies, how we are on track to make certain we have continued reserves that will uh, continue to make Sun River very fiscally sound and move forward uh, so that we're, in fact, the report stated that we're one of the best, if not the best in the United States of all the people they work with. Uh, we had updates on um, amenities and the North Pool, which seems to be right on track for a June 19th opening. Um, and we discussed uh, an owner survey that we will be uh, conducting 
kicking that off in uh, November, December, and kicking it off in January, February. So we will get uh, a lot more owner input as to the future. We talked about some changes in the handbooks for the uh, that are consistent with Oregon law uh, for our employees. And I think that was pretty well covered it unless there's something I'm missing uh, in this overview. Um, so the next item of business is to go through and approve the minutes. And Jackie, uh, if we could look at first the, uh, the minutes from, uh, if it, that's in tab, I'm sorry. Okay. So the, the first, the first uh, review, uh, are there any comments to the meetings of September 18th? Um, anything that, yes, Bill. Yeah, um, I have one um, suggestion. Uh, there was a really nice PowerPoint presentation by Mr. Tyvan, and on page two of the minutes, where it talks about staff budget presentations, I would suggest we add that that also was a PowerPoint. I was really impressed with the presentation and the uh, representation by department heads and staff. And so if we could just add that uh, it was a PowerPoint presentation. Hey, Jackie, you have that? Okay. Any, uh, okay. Any other comments? Page three. Uh, sorry. Uh, page three, second beginning paragraph, fourth line down. The word may, I think, should have been many guests have. Oh, the line begins, RPP staff at Shark have heard very few complaints about the restricted access and May guests should read many, I gather, would we'll guess. This is on page three, right? You got it, Jackie? Okay, any other uh, comments on the meeting of September 18th? All right, seeing none, uh, could I have a motion to approve these minutes for that date? Okay, second. Okay, we have a move second. Uh, all accepting the minutes, please say aye. 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 All, any opposed? No. Bill Burke. Okay, so we'll move on to that carried unanimously. We'll move on to the minutes of September 19th, which was the, the more formal meeting. Any comments on that text? Okay, seeing none, can I have a motion to approve? Okay, can I have a second? Okay, Keith Mobley seconded it. Um, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? None carries unanimously. All right. Boy, we are making such great progress, I'll tell you. <laughs> 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 so let's go with the next item. With uh, Director Beatum, would you lead us in the financial report and the approval of the unaudited uh, September, September financials? Yeah, the uh, financial report is in section two of your binder and starts on page 19 of the uh, digital content. And Jesus, can I share? All right, thank you. Yeah, let's see. And I think that's the one. What are we? All right. So uh, I will go to this part here and let me get my laser pointer. Yeah, a, Getting pretty fancy there, Director. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry about this. Okay. <laughs> All right. There we go. I think that's 
Oh, that's not, how can this? Also use your mouse. Yeah, there we go. That's a, all right. And let me see if I can uh, increase the size of this a little bit. Okay, so here are the uh, unaudited finances for SRWA. This is the wrong one, isn't it? This is September. That was September. I need to get you. That's the one we want, excuse me. That is the one we want. You were close though. So. Yeah, okay. There we go. We'll, we'll get back, we'll get to it. No, that's August or? Oh, no, no, now I got. <laughs> All right, I probably should stop this. <laughs> yeah, uh, we do have a hard copy. Uh, no. Yeah, I, I appreciate your patience here. <laughs> All right. Hey. hey. All right. So, a uh, couple things of note on the income statement, which is what we're looking at right now. And that is, first of all, you'll see that we, um, we have a uh, surplus for the year and, uh, or for the month, excuse me. So it's a 54,910 uh, operating budget surplus for the month. And that's driven by a couple factors, but one of the, the key factors, it's a little bit difficult to discern, but up here in program revenue, uh, near the top, 262,517. Uh, that is a little bit higher than what we've been seeing. And the reason why it's higher is because um, we voted last month on recognizing or on the RPP refund being 25%. And as soon as we rec uh, made the decision to refund 25%, Joe had been holding back recognizing revenue at the 50% level. So now he can start releasing more of those RPP funds and recognize that as revenue. And so there was like $171,000 that was recognized of RPP revenue in the month of September, uh, which helped us uh, <clears throat> in the, uh, improve our bottom line to $55,000 plus. There are some other things that uh, go into that. Uh, certainly there are you know, conti ongoing continuing um, savings in both salary and burden. You can see those here where my arrow is. It's about $56,000 on salary, $13,000 on burden. Uh, so total there, pretty close to $70,000 savings there. And then a $95,000 savings on materials for the month. And so all that combined into a uh, total expense savings of about $156,000 below budget. Uh, revenue was still below budget by $100,000, but uh, the combination makes us about $56,000 ahead of budget for the month, which, which is uh, a slight improvement over what we had last month. If you remember from last month, uh, we were running closer to a million dollar deficit or $900,000 deficit year to date, and now we're down to 872,000. Uh, so overall, pretty good month for SROA. Uh, I'll go to the next page here, if I can. Now I can't, uh, this is interesting, you can't do your mouse. All right, All right. go to the next page, which is the non-operating income statement. And again, uh, things are, are reasonably good uh, there. A couple things that I'll try to point out here is that you'll see, uh, not a whole lot of, they're up here in the top half on the revenue side, you can see that the uh, interest income continues to be uh, below plan by $11,000. That's not too exciting. exciting. Uh, roads and pathway project. And here you see we only spent $19,000 in the month where we had planned on spending $300,000. And essentially what that is, is, is that at, uh, back in the springtime when we first uh, started with this COVID thing, uh, James and the team looked through all their capital programs and expenditures and made some decisions on some things that could be deferred until next year, given the uncertainty of 2020. And so they pushed forward about $300,000 of road and pathway work uh, from 2020 into 2021. Uh, so 
<clears throat> it has a savings for us this year, but it's gonna come back and bite us next year. So it's, this is work that does absolutely have to be done. It's just that we have deferred it for one year. Okay, and so uh, that you know, gave us a, a positive surplus on the non-operating income of 192,000, uh, budgeted to lose 88,000, so it's 281,000 dollars ahead of plan, uh, putting us 320,000 dollars ahead of plan year to date. Okay, so uh, Gerhard, if I can add something on that, uh, everybody is very always interested in roads and pathways, and it appears that. Um, when I know this year's budget that you're proposing is 800,000. So it's making it up there, just as you said. Right. Um, and also then we've got circle 11, I think, uh, the end of this month. So that'll balance out some of this. Yeah, this, this is just for the month of September. Right, okay. right. I'm just looking at year to date. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so, so obviously that work will get done. It's just that the decision was made to defer some of it into mm -hmm. Uh, next year. If uh, this would be public works question, or you, but with all the heavy trucks carrying all the gravel and everything, did that degrade the roads more than normal? So we have to address them more quickly. I, I think that's a question we probably have to address to Mark Smith. I don't know if James, you've got a, quite a perspective on that. Yeah, we had conversations about that um, this year and after, you know, assessment of our roads. Um, just the, it seems like there are a lot of trucks that came through for a period of months, but overall the, 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 the number is very small and compared to the amount of traffic that you get a, like on a public road or a highway. So it didn't have any derogatory effect on our roads. Um, related to that, though, um, Circle 11, um, that's specifically why it's being paved next week, is we waited till after the heavy traffic of the trucks and just a visitor season to do those improvements. So, so no, it didn't have any overall derogatory effect. And from what I've heard from Mark in the past on that very <coughs> spec, he is that the multiple axles spread those loads uh, substantially yeah. as they traversed over the streets. Uh, one comment I'll make about Circle 11, because I had a conversation with Mike, Mark about this, is that uh, when they rip up Circle 11, they are going to put conduit under Circle 11. <laughs> so so, so that, that's a good thing. So the next thing I wanted to do is go to the balance sheet uh, and the asset side of the balance sheet. Uh, this is page, uh, let's see if we can make this thing go away. This is page 22 in the digital format, what I have on the screen right now. This is kind of a pain in the butt the way they do this. Okay, okay so uh, the thing I want to point out on here is if you look at the top section, which is uh, what we call cash and investments, total cash and investments, $12.5 million. And uh, you can see in our operating fund, we still have $2.6 million. Uh, the operating reserve fund, this is the shark smoky day fund or, or you know, COVID fund, uh, whatever you want to classify, 1.3 million. Uh, the reserve fund restricted the 8.2 million. This is the fund that we use for replacing capital items or purchase of new capital items. So this is the fund that's paying for the North Pool right now. And uh, when Joe talked about, you know, different things that were your, or the, when we talked about the reserve list yesterday, those items that we would uh, renew come out of that fund. And then the shark reserve fund, and Joe had a small comment about that. And those are the people who are continuing to pay up their shark dues. And those funds have got to be used for maintenance on something inside this building. And so uh, we generally end up using up most of that fund each year. Uh, but, you know, again, it depends on what maintenance needs to be done in shark in a given year. The good news, though, is, is that, you know, and this is the point I really wanted to make is $12.5 million. Because we have $12.5 million in cash and investments, that gives us an awful lot of flexibility. And in fact, when we talk about budget for next year, for 2021, this will become very important. And because we are going to end up 2020, and I think I mentioned this last, uh, last month, that we'll end up 2020 with close to a million dollar deficit to budget. Our budget was to break even. We're going to come in probably somewhere around, you know, maybe closer to $900,000 short. Okay. 
Joe's putting together the budget. Uh, Joe and James and the team are putting together the budget for 2021. It's not finalized yet. They have another round of discussions going on internally. It was reviewed by the finance committee uh, earlier this week. Uh, we will have another meeting at the end of this month where we will see the final draft at that point in time, uh, which is the draft that will then come to the board in the month of November. Uh, right now it's looking like about a $1.1 million deficit for next year. So you have about $900,000 deficit for this year, and you have a $1.1 million deficit for next year. And the question that would <clears throat> rise in anybody's mind, certainly my mind says, okay, how can we possibly fund that? That's $2 million shortfall. How are we gonna fund it? And that's why I'm pointing out our cash position. We can fund it. And what we will be proposing is an increase in assessments and the increase in assessments, the maximum we can do without a participant or a vote of the ownership is 6%. It, be, it may be 6% or very close to 6%. And then the other thing is, is that we got this uh, operating reserve fund of 1.3 million and we will be tapping that operating reserve fund. So we're gonna tap the operating reserve fund. We're gonna increase the assessment. And because of the liquidity we have, the amount of cash we have available, we think based on Joe's analysis, those things, those two things, will allow us to get through next year without a special assessment. And so theoretically, there'll be a different set of circumstance in 2022 with the virus. Yeah, that, that's the whole. I see assumption. That's yep. the whole, right. Yep. And so, and you know, so a lot of things can happen next year that we don't have full control. We don't have clear visibility of right now. We don't know if the COVID restrictions are gonna get tighter, if they're gonna get looser. Uh, what we're going to be able to do with shark, what's going to happen with North Pool, all those kinds of, there's a lot of variables in the air. And so, but the thing is, is that because of our cash position, we have a lot of flexibility. We don't have to do things until we get more information. So we can wait till later in next year and then decide, okay, if we're going to take money out of the operating reserve fund, how much money do we need to take? Uh, and that will depend on what the situation is with COVID next year and what we can and cannot do with our recreational facilities. And I, uh, Gerhard, I think it's worth emphasizing that operating reserve fund line number three is exactly for this purpose. It is. Yeah, that's correct. And, and Or a COVID type or a, some kind of an emergency right. that we did not anticipate. Yeah. And so that will be probably a bigger discussion next month, but I just wanted to kind of give you a little bit of a heads up where we're at. Uh, we think at this point in time, with an increase in the assessment pretty near, near or at the 6% level, uh, we should be able to get through next year uh, with uh, even running a deficit this year and next year by leveraging some, not all, but part of that operating reserve fund uh, plus the 6% increase in assessments. Okay. okay, so if there's any questions about that, I can handle those. Uh, other than that, I don't think there's anything else uh, uh, too significant. I think, you know, we did have a brief conversation yesterday about um, what our money is being, how our money is being used by First Interstate Wealth and First Interstate Bank, that is what is it being invested in. And we are having to make some changes in those investments uh, because of uh, <clears throat> the Oregon State statute as to what a homeowners association can invest in. And so some of those funds were invested in indirect um, guarantees by the US government. And we can only invest in things that have got a direct guarantee by the US government. And so we're transitioning out of those indirect investments into the direct investments. Uh, the, the big impact, the, the impact is, is that we're going into a lower interest rate environment. And so uh, at this point in time, when we look at it from a finance committee perspective, what we're hoping and it is a little bit of a hope right now, but what we're hoping is that we can get enough of return on our investments to cover our cost to first interstate wealth management so that we're in a break even situation. And that's about the best that we're gonna be able to do next year, unless the interest rate environment changes. I think that pretty much covers uh, September. I don't know if there's any questions. I'd be happy to answer those questions. Uh, if not, we can move on. 
the pandemic is not going to affect our position relative to other homeowner associations in terms of our being the least expensive? Not at all, not at all, not even close, not even close. And so, uh, and this is, this is something that I mentioned in my, uh, uh, the Sun River Scene Treasurer's Report is that, you know, we, uh, when I talk about these concepts, I finish up by saying, we still are the lowest cost uh, resort community here in Central Oregon, by far, by far. Well, thank you. <laughs> All right, seeing no further comments or questions, uh, could I get a motion for approving the unaudited uh, financials for September? I, I so move that we approve the September uh, 2020 unaudited financial report. I second it, Director Peterson. Okay. All in favor of uh, accepting the motion, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Carries unanimously. All right. Uh, the next item of business is for our general manager to give his update. James, would you proceed? Yeah, uh, thank you. This is in section three of your board book. Um, I'm not going to go through every bullet point. Uh, and the very first section under administration, the first, uh, I think, five bullet points all deal with uh, the COVID requirements that we've been dealing with for months now. And actually, we're in a holding pattern. The rules have not changed. Um, our recreation facilities, the visitors have slowed. Um, so we're kind of in a holding pattern. But, but um, in working conversation with the police chief, this past week, um, there's some, we're understanding there's some draft revisions to some rules that are going to be coming from the governor's office. And so we'll monitor those and implement them as necessary. Um, working, we've been working with uh, various staff. I've been working with various staff. Everyone's been working together at SROA uh, with regard to addressing a lot of the comments and concerns that you've heard at the owners forum. A lot of those have dealt with the, the influx of visitors and actually just more owners being here this year and the impacts such as to the bike paths, such as Cardinal Landing, the river use. And so without going on about that, because you've heard about it for the past couple meetings is we have a rental registry task force in place that will address necessary rule changes um, or information and education, how to get that to the rental companies and to those visiting Sun River. Uh, next week, next Thursday, we have our annual rules meeting that will include members of the Covenants Committee, Sun River Police and Fire, members of the board, where we revisit this past year and look for any rule changes that need to be implemented in Sun River's rules. One of those will be what I talked about earlier, access to and from uh, Sun River Common property from the river. You know, how can we better manage that? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, continue to work with our community development staff um, on the large number of applications. And actually, there was an appeal that uh, was processed this past month, an appeal of a, of a new home that was being developed. So we worked with the appeals board, um, President Skinner and members of the appeals board on that. Uh, again, continue. I continue to help with our community development staff, just the large number of, of applications that have come in. Um, when you look at, you know, we'll get into it a little bit more. When you look at the actual report on the numbers uh, for the year, it looks like we're down for the year, but we've had a great influx just in the past two to three months of the number of projects. Uh, and Director Gillies, I know you were, you participated at the last design committee meeting and, and you see, you know, um, some of what I, what I've talked to you about is reworking our design manual and the design review process, because some of the projects are very small and it becomes a very tedious type of review. So that really eats up our staff time and the efficiency of what they can get done and, and how fast they can process things, which affects all the owners that really just want to get a project done. That seems very simple. Uh, I met with the database consultant multiple times. Director Beenan was involved in that. Um, we finally got a workable contract with our database consultant that's going to come in and work on some initial fixes for us. And then, as we talked about yesterday in, in, a, in a discussion briefly about the budget, uh, phase two of that consultant's um, work will occur in 2021. 
And that's really getting us um, set up for the next steps of hiring an internal database administrator so that we hire that position. There's a clear outline and direction for what they have to do to fix our database issues. Uh, budget. Um, <clears throat> Uh, meeting with um, all of our staff internally, uh, accounting staff, Joe, instrumental, obviously, and all the department heads uh, last month to prepare the budget presentation that the staff gave to you. And then also the draft budgets, um, as Gerhard just talked about, we're continuing to refine those. Telecommunications task force. Um, you got a quick update on that yesterday. Uh, just continuing to work with that task force and come to some fruition uh, with regard to which direction we take. Uh, again, I, re I referenced the rental registry task force. Um, I'm taking the lead on that. We had our first meeting two weeks ago. The next meeting will be on November 4th. So it was a very good first meeting. It was uh, very well attended and everyone gave positive feedback uh, as going forward for the project. The Recycling Facility Task Force, there have been two meetings. There's a third meeting scheduled for next week. Keith Caceres is taking the lead on that. And again, this is revisiting some of what the board discussed last year and coming up with a recommendation to the board as to whether it's something uh, that the facility gets built or some other alternative me uh, methods. So that is intended to be wrapped up, but Keith is taking the lead on that. Uh, I continue to participate with Sun River Lapine Economic Development Board. It is a, uh, they meet once a month. It's made up of, of uh, folks from Lapine, folks from Edco, myself from Sun River, Chambers of Commerce. And really it's looking at how to, to spur economic development in the South County. The majority of it is really looking at the city of Lapine. Um, but there, what happens in Lapine, whether it's something that could potentially happen on the highway or infrastructure wise, it makes sense for us to be part of that so that we have some knowledge and potential influence as how that may or may not ever affect Sun River. James, have there been any yes. specific initiatives that have grown out of that relationship? Uh, not yet. This is only the second month that I participated, but I uh, participated with them in my previous uh, position with Deschutes County. Deschutes County has a presence and they own much of the industrial land. So for us, it would be, um, I think as it may, we don't have a lot of economic development, traded sector manufacturing per se here in Sun River. That's kind of what they're focused on in Lapine. So for us, I think it would be more of what can we do to, to assist economic development in the South County. So uh, whether it is, I, I would say support in the general sense for, for uh endeavors they want to take on to boost economic development in the pine. But again, I such mean, a, I'm sorry. Such as telecommunications? Uh, telecommunications, um, they're looking at, they're doing a lot of advertising right now, trying to sell their industrial land in Lapine, trying to attract um, uh, traded sector businesses, manufacturing businesses. So really they're just looking at myself, my participation as support that Sun River can support them. Uh, let's see. And again, as you heard yesterday, just a quick in our update on executive session, we continue to work with our legal counsel on uh, a few of the challenges that we've had, legal actions that have been pending. Uh, moving into accounting, again, right now is budget, budget, budget. Um, as Joe gave his presentation to you yesterday on how the financials for Sun River work, um, as Gerhard pointed out, you know, we had our initial budget meeting with the finance committee this past Thursday morning. We'll have another one on October 30th. And between now and then, uh, I'll be working with Joe and all the department heads to refine that budget. Essentially, we're going to be looking at how can we cut some more out of the budget due to our deficit, but also still maintaining the level of service that Sun River is known to provide to all of its owners. Uh, under IT, a lot of the uh, IT work this past month, um, Brad Olson has been involved in our negotiations with our database consultant is, and also the telecommunications task force. Um, Jesus is at every meeting that we ever have regarding Zoom connection. 
And uh, so, yes, Jesus is vitally important with uh, doing what he's doing today. And I often say that, that in, in SROA, I think because he attends every meeting, he knows more than anyone else what's going on with SROA. He'll be qualified for the board here shortly. Um, and so there was a lot of, uh, in the month of September, aside from what I referenced, there was a lot of day-to-day uh, -day work that needed to be done by IT. We had a power outage that affected some of our uh, systems. So, so Brad was working on uh, correcting those. Uh, as you know, also through IT, um, all of you were assigned a new email address to be used specifically for Sun River purposes. That keeps, uh, allows us to keep record of everything that's just purely Sun, Sun River SROA related um, that is being sent to you. Um, it, and it kind of isolates your own personal private email from anything related to Sun River. So it's more of a safety thing, not, not, a, not a computer hacking type safety, but also a safety for your own personal private information. James? Uh, uh, yes. Always should probably keep in mind that this, uh, that is emails and SROA, anything we write between ourselves and SROA is discoverable. So be cognizant of that. Please. Also, James, on that, uh, on a task force that Clark and I are on, I'm getting it at my home address. We might need to, are, are you getting it that way as well? <laughs> there, there, I've made the mistake myself. I've sent it to some of the old email addresses. So I think that we just put this in place. There'll be a, a, a little transition. Okay. Um, and we made some internal changes so that if we accidentally hit one of your uh, personal emails, it shows up as old. It says old. So we have a note. So it'll transition. Yeah. Um, last thing is IT worked with... Um, our communications department on our Shark website to provide some assistance to them. Moving into communications, um, that says the very first bullet, it says uh, August, but it should say September. The advertising was down by about $10,000. Again, that is attributable to COVID. And um, it, it really comes back to the scene is not as available via pick them up at every uh, location because some businesses have, uh, they get rid of those things, those handheld things. Like if you go in the front of the recreation access to shark, you won't see all those flyers. That's the same thing with the scene and all the private businesses. So it's affected folks wanting to advertise. Also they're, they're, they're saving money. So, so that's why that's down. Um, but if you look at under the website uh, section, there's still significant uh, in September views of our website and that has to do with the number of people that have been in Sun River extended visitor stays and owner stays so there's still a lot of interest in what is happening in Sun River and with SROA um, and lastly with regard to information that uh, that folks are interested in we continue to update and make sure all of our information is current and relevant with regard to COVID and use of all of our facilities and the rules that are applicable in Sun River. And maybe the lastly, what I should say is um, Linda in our communication department, yesterday was her last day for a while because she's going off to have a baby. So Susan will be by herself for a while, but it's lucky we're getting kind of into a, a or slower time of year. So we'll be able to all help her as need be. Uh, community development, I talked a little bit about that, and in terms of the numbers, uh, it, it, it's right now, it's, uh, we're, we're getting into a slower time of year, so uh, it's giving our staff time to catch up uh, on some of the reviews, um, some of the final inspections, uh, we've reduced uh, the overall active number, the number of active permits, because folks are finishing their projects before the winter comes. We're doing our final review uh, and those projects are being closed out. Also, um, we, were, we were short a person via, uh, or a partial position via layoff uh, from back in April due to COVID. So what we did is we added a person, a three quarter time person that split between uh, our um, accounting department, our finance department and community development, just to come in and, and do things that can't otherwise get done because everyone's busy. And again, we were, we were down a person in 
our accounting department and in our community development department. So this three quarter person is really able enabling our permanent staff that's here to get things done. Uh, some of the more trivial menial type things. Uh, let's see. Natural resources. Uh, Again, this is September was pretty similar to, uh, to August. As we get into the end of the summer and early fall, it's a lot of ladder fuel reduction work that's doing, and that's uh, Patty and her staff. Um, and we had the war on weeds that was very successful. Um, and it, it's interesting to me, you know, when I drive around, you know, central Oregon, when I come into Sun River, I don't really see any noxious weeds anywhere. And so that's a tribute to Patty and her staff and that program. Uh, again, as Patty noted, just like all the other departments, she was busy preparing her budget as well. Into public works, uh, some of the under parks and common and tennis and some of the pathways and roads, um, there was summer, summertime maintenance proceeded in September as it did in August and July. So there weren't a lot of changes there. There's ongoing daily work in all of our parks and all of our pathways and all of our roadways. Uh, on the facilities side of things, um, I think I talked about this last month, our cinder storage shed, all the permits are approved uh, due to, just like you heard in the North Pool discussion yesterday, just, just the supply chain is broken in a lot of construction projects. So, you know, when we, or, we were going to, going to order the cinder storage shed, it was going to be delivered in November or December at a time when we couldn't construct it. So it's not gonna be built until spring. We're gonna have that delivered uh, probably in March. We didn't wanna have it delivered and let it sit in the snow all year long. So that, that will be going forward in the spring. Um, with regard to shark, uh, those items, we have our, our facility maintenance team in public works. And Mark was talking a little bit about this yesterday. The facility maintenance team works on those bigger facility issues, whether it's a, it's, a, it's a motor for our doors, whether it is a HVAC system, something like that. And I just want to point out, they will take care of the building itself. And as we get into recreation, you'll see we, we also have aquatics folks. They deal specifically with the pool. So there's a distinction there that needs to be made. The facilities maintenance team that has been assembled through Public Works is fantastic, and they work hand in hand with our uh, aquatics team on, under recreation. And then there are a lot of uh, miscellaneous items, uh, gate installation project that is now complete at our uh, right behind the administration building for our RV. Um, and, and then just a lot of painting and replacement that typical maintenance stuff that you that we have done. And then Mark and various members of his team also are participating in the recycling center task force uh, monitoring the North Pole project Mark and Keith both tribute to them they're there every day working with the contractor. Moving into recreation, uh, continued, uh, it, it talks about August was a month where we hit our stride, and that is true, um, but it continued into September. We had all of our systems down following all the COVID protocol, protocols, and um, as we talked about, everyone was, is, was generally happy with what we were able to provide this year, and it seemed to be we were providing, we were able to provide more access than any of the other local facilities such as Athletic Club of Bend or Juniper Pool for Bend Park and Rec. And so folks were very happy. Um, we did repairs to the indoor pool uh, in the early part of September uh, prior to the September 20th closing of the outdoor pool. So now as soon as the outdoor pool closed September 20th, indoor pool is now open. And as you heard, we have multiple sessions a day where we can have 50 people. Uh, with regard to some of the other fall and winter operations, the Tubing Hill, Blacklight Blast, we're still working with our staff to figure out you know, what we can provide with regard to staffing and costs to operate those, but we want to provide those because they are popular when they've been provided. And then events, again, we have no, no events that have been scheduled for this facility. What we have done is we've worked recently with, um, such as this meeting right here, uh, with our other committees, OEC, um, is that if it's a meeting like this or a class that can be held where we can control the seating to make sure all the COVID protocols are followed, then we have this facility available. But for events where we can't, because we have a liability, we're on the hook for, for making sure that those are maintained since our, it's our facility, we don't have any events. So 
wedding receptions, family reunions, those things where people are mingling, we still are not doing that. And again, that's part of what's eating into our recreation revenue. Uh, and then on facilities, just kind of wrapping this up, the we did, um, as I said, early September, we closed the indoor pool and did our, our maintenance that needed to be done there. Um, and then the very last bullet point items uh, are just listing things that we did here in Shark. It's a large facility. There's a lot of moving components here and it just requires ongoing maintenance. So with that, if you had any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I would have a question, James, about yes. the boat launch facility. Mm -hmm. There apparently was no plan made to provide portage once the river level fell to a point where you couldn't get from the launch to the river. I experienced yes, I mean, that yesterday. I was, I was out there, yeah, um, <laughs> earlier in the week it, because I got the same. I got phone call, and the water level was really, really low. Okay. So, in terms of getting from the ramp itself out to the main river, there you're going through. That, don't walk in the mud there because you won't get out of the mud there. Um, <laughs> so, so it is. I mean, other than if you had something that really just had a draft that was really low, you it's you can't get into. You can, but you had to be, it's very tricky. But no, there were no provisions by us um, to provide access to the river. And again, I mean, it, it's, you know, I, I asked this question um, and nobody really knew in our staff that when that was built, it was based upon historic uh, water flows, water levels, but we're in a drought year and we have Wiki Up Brett Reservoir that essentially dried up except for the main stream. So I think that's part of the issue this year as opposed to other years. I was quite surprised. We had yep. the kayak ready to launch and then some fellows from SROA came and they were there to inspect the level. And yep. they came back and we watched a father and daughter on a raft, a small one, wading through the mud <laughs> to get to the river and decided we'll just put the kayak back on the car. Yeah. Why, there's always Mary McCallum Park or Cardinal Landing Bridge where you can. <laughs> I had to say it. The door was open. I had to say it. Any other uh, questions of James or comments? All right. The next item is committee reports. It's tab number four. Uh, I see some correspondence from Design Committee, Finance, Nominations Committee. Any any comments anyone would like to make? For the uh, OEC, they are joining with, or the Sun River U is joining with us so that we can help in PR, advertising, insurance, able to work together to get the most we can out of a time when it's hard to do anything. Positive move. All right, any other comments related to committee reports? We'll move on to the uh, to Mark, if you lead us through the Sun River Service District reports. <laughs> Sorry. Well, the point is I forgot notes on the kitchen table Short-term memories might be a challenge, uh, but I've got Jackie to help me out. No That's pressure. right. Um, it, we did two, two major things this week. One, we had some board training for the new members. That, uh, so that went quite smoothly. And um, the two chiefs in particular did uh, a pretty succinct um, presentations on their structure and operations. So that was very helpful. Um, the big thing might be the, uh, we're still working through the strategic plan, uh, trying to get that done by the end of the calendar year, which will include, uh, we're trying to put together a couple of smaller work groups to uh, address specific items in the strategic plan. Um, the proposed involvement of People all over the community is uh, quite inclusive. Um, so we would hope 
and expect to get good discussions with those groups before we finalize anything. Uh, the finances are going pretty well. We don't have any problems on that side. And in fact, uh, you could say that we have some accounts receivable due to uh, fire personnel that have been out working other fires down in California and all over Oregon as well. But I would like to add that the issue of PERS, although it's not being addressed this year, can come back and just be a major problem in the next few years. Yeah. And the, uh, from what I've seen over in Salem, they'll continue to try and do something with that, but they never get anywhere. So we'll, we'll see. Um, we have two fire employees coming on board next week. So that's very good news. Um, on the other side of that, we have two that might possibly be out on medical leave. <laughs> so it's up and down. Um, and one thing we've been talking about for a couple of months with the chief and, and give a uh, fire a police chief in particular is he hasn't been at full strength since he arrived. Um, and we've seen that throughout the years here. So what we're looking into is, is there a way we can manage the budget to over hire so we still have active officers while the new officers go through whatever required ramp up of training. Uh, it, it, can take, it can take months and months before you get an active duty officer. So that's, that's hard. Um, when, when, when we lose somebody. Pardon me? When we lose somebody, a firefighter or a police person, what, what are they doing? Are they going to a bigger municipality in general? In general, yeah or retirement. Um, Even though they may have one or two people in the pipeline, it can take up to 10 months and somebody's gonna retire yeah. in two months. So, you know, for eight months, they're down a person. What's the retirement age these days? Uh, retirement for police, uh, police officers under PERS is, is 53. Good deal, yeah. And I believe that's the same requirement. Okay. Yeah, there was 53, 50, wasn't 153, 158, I forget which, or maybe it is both. And when we, when we invest in a new officer or a firefighter and send them through training, is there some kind of um, implied commitment at that point in time? or is they If we send them for training, they're going as our employee. So they've already been hired. The good thing for both police and fire is... Um, we have active lists and we're have, we are actively working to get people on board. So that's. And they just interviewed, I think seven or eight for one person because they go through extensive physical, mental, uh, uh, medical background checks before they're actually hired. And that can take up to a month to two months. How, how does the, um, uh, the service districts pay scales and benefits uh, compare with other uh, other localities? Well, because they're PERS employees, it's comparable. Um, that stated, under PERS, there's essentially three tiers, tier one, tier two, and then the latest. We do, no, I think we only have one tier one employee but we still have to pay rates into the pool, if you will. The PERS rate is, is set kind of like a, a pool of employees. So they get fat Benny. So if you're familiar with PERS, mm -hmm. so you get your, you get your 6%, you pay your 6% or your employer pays a 6%. Under tier one, whatever went into that was guaranteed a rate of return of 8%. Oh. Yeah, per, per, per year, as I recall. Yeah, uh, the, the the next two tiers were just no, whatever the investment is. So it's it's a little, it's not as rich. Um, but there's still still got to get through the bump of the tier one for another four to six years before everything begins to um, come down and flatten out again. So that's mm -hmm. 
Everybody all over the state, all local jurisdictions are continue to struggle with that. Um, PERS costs can, can go as high as 40%. Mm -hmm. But uh, aside from uh, PERS, the salaries, how are they in comparison with other communities? Well, they're, they're competitive. And they're negotiated. I mean, like there's yeah. a yeah. 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 So it's union wages, competitive throughout the region. Um, there's always, when you go through those negotiations, what do you use for comparables? So, Mm -hmm. Either side argues what their comparables should be, and we're, we've done pretty well with that as far as making sure it's reg regional and um, applicable. Great. Thank you. Uh, the only thing else I might say is um, we did get a quick hit on some of the things the rental registry group was talking about. It was a, a, a significant list of items they're going to try and work through that dovetail very closely with all the work on the, the paths, the river, et cetera. So it should be an interesting winter to see if we can uh, get ourselves ready for next year. And we're very supportive. Yeah. I mean, they really liked it and they thought the people working together were doing it very well. That's all I've got, Jackie. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? Just one little thing. That's our only Instead of using the Outlook, they're using Apple. So of course, they <laughs> you get to try to learn two new ones, so. Well, thank you both for that, uh, that update. I'm, I'm glad you're, uh, Mark, if you'll continue to keep us updated on full strength, because I think we'll need it as we go through this rental registry process and we actually need more enforcement. Uh, the other curiosity I have, you know, when I look at the fire report of activity from the chief, it breaks it down uh, some lapine with very small bend, mutual assistance, and then Sun River on the calls. Uh, does the police do the same? I, I'd just like to know how many calls are outside of Sun River that we are subsidizing. They do. I don't see it in the report. I guess it's in the verbiage then, huh? Yeah. No, I'm just curious how much of our activity that we're paying for is going outside of Sun River. So just a curiosity that I'm going to continue to ask about. I'll get some more detail for next time. Get some uh, summaries. Outstanding. Outstanding. Our outside of Sun River. I can't hear you. As a Sun River police officer leaves the area, yep. either police officer from Lapine or uh -huh. from Bend will come to Sun River. To okay, I, again, I'd just like to know the stat. And uh, because the last time I called the police, it was 23 minute response time. So that to me is totally unacceptable. But as I was explained by the chief, everybody was out on calls outside Sun River. So just curious about that issue. I'm curious about uh, the effect of the pandemic on both police and fire. Uh, right. They are kind of the tip of the spear in dealing with the kinds of problems that uh, we hear about, but they are the people who are charged with dealing with it directly. How is the general morale of both of those entities? I couldn't say directly, but indirectly, I understand things are going well. Um, they're still adhering to pretty strict protocols. Um, they're very cognizant of every call they go out on. Um, so they're physically prepared to that. And, and the, what I've heard is the EMTs, paramedics, everybody is okay. They're okay. They're being safe. They're being safe at home. They're being safe at work. So we've had no issues yet. Well, like you say, as it goes on, it kind of wears everybody down. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think we're fortunate in having the two chiefs that we have. My impression is that they are both strong leaders and are doing well with their respective departments. Yeah. Seem to be, yes. So do we have uh, 
James, do you have any current data on the number of cases of COVID we've had here? I remember it, September 1, the last time we looked at that, it was 10 cases in our zip code. Yeah, I haven't looked at it recently. Um, and actually, I think it was last, I think it was, it was uh, in our zip code, it was eight cases okay. total out of uh, 6,800 people that live in the zip code. So just it's very, very, very minute number of cases in our mm. zip code. I just, I don't have it recently. No, that's, that's fine. Okay, any other comments on SSD? All right, let's move on to uh, tab number A, which is um, a variety of, of folks that are being appointed to committees. And uh, let's see, is there, you can see that yes. list. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, um, typically we have a, There will be a um, motion that's yeah. set up for you in there. It's not in there, but essentially right. we need a motion just to appoint and acknowledge these folks to the various committees as listed on this. Right. Okay. So, so as you can see, there's appointments to the covenants committee, uh, various chair appointments to the various committees, and then uh, the board liaisons as noted. So, um, I think we've discussed this roughly in the past, but uh, do I have a motion to accept uh, all of these nominations? Director Murray, move to the committee task force action to section A. We've got that, Mark and Mobley. Um, all right, all in favor, signify by well, saying well, aye. Uh, I'm sorry. Could, could, could I say something? Of uh, course. I just wanted to ask, has anybody vetted that guy um, name's Bob Nelson. Do we know anything about him? That's a wild card. <laughs> you know, that's a very good point. Maybe, maybe we ought to postpone that for a month. But I don't know. <laughs> anyway. All right. Uh, so it's been uh, uh, all in favor. Signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Carries unanimously. Go to tab B, e, please. Let's see, I, there's no actions there. So let's move to uh, number C. Uh, this is a capital transfer, which uh, is consistent with normal practice. Any questions on that uh, at this point of our uh, financial chair? Okay, seeing none, can I have a motion? Any further comments or questions? Uh, yep. All right. All right. Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposition? Okay, carries unanimously. All right, we got item number, let's see here. D is the employee handbook changes, consistent with Oregon law as we learned yesterday. And are there any further comments about those changes that anyone would like to discuss? Okay, so can I have a motion on acceptance of those uh, recommendations, those revisions? Okay, uh, a second, please. Okay, so Jackie and Mark. All right, uh, it's been moved and seconded. A any further comments? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposition? All right, carries unanimously. Uh, let's see, where are we now? Okay, yeah. E? Yeah, item E. This is the. Um, E is the approval of the Comprehensive Owner Survey Work Group. And James, you're gonna, will you give us a little more there? Yeah, it, um, in the motion, it's, uh, it doesn't have any specific names, but uh, what we're proposing is that, because um, it's gonna be a very, very brief uh, time period for this to review the questions as presented by our consultant. So I will be sending out an email to the board to see uh, who would like to participate. Bill, I understand you wanted to participate in this. 
Um, and also it, it's giving you the, or giving me the authorization to populate that group uh, made up of representatives of owners, the board, the potentially committee members, just to make sure that we're asking the right questions. James, uh, we also might consider having some members from IAM. Yes. Provide some continuity. Okay. I, Director Mobley, move to direct the SROA general manager to populate an owner survey work group consisting of Sun River owners, an SROA board member, and SROA staff members to assist in formulating the appropriate questions for the upcoming comprehensive owner survey. Further move to allow additional members to be added to the work group as deemed necessary or beneficial, including IAM members. Okay. All right, Director Dean in second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further comment? Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposition? Carries unanimously. Okay, are there other business items that need to be addressed by this uh, at this board meeting? James? I was just going to, going to note uh, very quick. Um, that uh, last, back in September, we had an initial training with our three new members of the board on all of the documents, the governing documents for Sun River. And then just real quick into the November meeting items related to that, we will have legal training by our attorneys that will come here as they do every year, um, talking about fiduciary duty, fiscal responsibility, et cetera, that is very important to the operation. Um, We'll also have the budget presented to you in November. And then one other item that we had a presentation on, uh, I can't remember if it was September or August meeting um, by Boone Zimmerly from Project Wildfire, Community Wildfire Protection Plan that's being worked on and jointly with um, Shoots County, the Forest Service, Sun River Service District, Police Fire. That will be coming to you in November for review and adoption or acknowledgement of that. So that's it, that's all I had. Okay, so I think we're down to uh, meeting debrief. Are there any other comments that anyone would like to add to uh, compliment or stress any of the items we've covered today? Seeing none, can I have a motion to adjourn? Director Murray, move to adjourn. Second, Director Beenan. Been moved, moved and seconded. seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposition? opposition? Carries unanimously. All right, thank, thank you. you all. We have not heard from Director Gokey. I'm very Oh, yes. How is Director Goki? How are you? Oh, I'm, I'm fine. I just have a pain in my lower back that. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Anyhow, I have an 8 a.m. Monday morning appointment to. Uh, revisit with my favorite physical therapist and uh, we'll see where we go from there very good good we'll luck try, yeah Thank try you. to have try to have a good weekend <laughs> <laughs> take care bye Thank